This is Radio Health Journal. I'm Reed Pence. This week, sex addiction. Is it real? Psychiatrists are rightfully concerned about pathologizing sexual behavior now. However, I think that there is, you know, a boatload of evidence that sexual addiction does exist. The reality of sex addiction with Radio Health Journal returns. I'm Nancy Benson, host of Radio Health Journal. If you enjoy Radio Health Journal, you'll also like our sister show. Here's a preview of what they're covering on Viewpoints this week. Hi, this is Sean Waldron, production director for Viewpoints. This week on Viewpoints, we revisit two popular segments. Up first, the lives of introverts and how that label is often misunderstood. Introverted people are individuals who are more apt to wanting to be on their own, are overstimulated by their environment, and feel more recharged and energized when they're away from other people. It's not that they're not sociable. It's not that they don't have social skills. It's not that they're anxious around other people. It's just that they're very easily overstimulated, and their energies are more recharged when they're on their own. That was Dr. Todd Cashton from George Mason University. Sophia Demling, author of The Introvert's Way, also joins the show. Then in segment two, linguist Vivian Cook helps sort out why the English language has so many conflicting spelling rules. Here's a taste of what's to come with the second guest in that segment, author Neil McLeod Waldman. We just accept all these words from every different country and we don't change the spelling, so we end up with silent letters from them. No, for instance, would have come in from Old English where we would have pronounced it, you know, something like that. And we get silent letters in night, the G-H there. That sound is a guttural sound from Old English where they would say nicht. So they come from the way we used to sound it or from other languages. And uh, we just have never sorted it out. Listen to those great shows this week on your favorite radio station, on our website, or subscribe on iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Some disorders we accept as real without a second thought. There's no doubt, for example, that cancer and the flu really exist. But how about others? For example, sex addiction. Is there such a thing, or is it just an excuse? According to the latest edition of the Authoritative Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, or the DSM-5, there's no such thing as sex addiction. But the same was said not too long ago about compulsive gambling. Psychiatrists said, no, that's not an addiction. It's an impulse control disorder. But extensive research finally convinced mental health professionals to reclassify compulsive gambling. Now it is a pathological addiction, and many experts are hoping the same will happen with compulsive sexual behaviors. I think the DSM-5 is correct insofar as psychiatrists have made some mistakes in the past when it comes to pathologizing sexual behavior. They made a dreadful mistake in the last century about homosexuality and called it a disease. So I think that psychiatrists are rightfully concerned about pathologizing sexual behavior now. However, I think that there is, you know, a boatload of evidence that sexual addiction does exist, that people look into it, and I guess it really hasn't met the threshold for both the scientific criteria in the DSM-5, but also hasn't met the threshold because of concerns that we may be over-pathologizing normal behavior, which I think is a good thing to be concerned about. That's Dr. Kenneth Paul Rosenberg, an addiction psychiatrist at Weill Cornell Medical College and author of Infidelity, Why Men and Women Cheat. He says that during his training at Cornell back in the 80s in both chemical addictions and sexual disorders, his professors didn't believe that sex addiction existed. But Rosenberg had patients at the time who self-identified as sex addicts. So I had to go somewhere to get that information. And the place I went is Dr. Carnes, Patrick Carnes, who is just about the grandfather of this area. And it's controversial. But Dr. Carnes, for decades now, has been working in the area of sex addiction, has authored many books and many journal articles. So I studied with him to try to bring what he has to offer into the psychiatric world. In fact, Dr. Carnes and I 
as recently as a month ago, taught a course at the American Psychiatric Association about sex addiction. And that course, by the way, is generally sold out, and people rarely leave until the four hours are up because psychiatrists really need this kind of information. It doesn't really matter whether it's been peer-reviewed and deemed worthy of being in the DSM or what have you. Like, what matters is that just find something that's going to help. So in my case, like, I don't know if I'm a sex addict or was a sex addict or not. Judging by the fact that I wrote the game, probably yes. I cheated on my girlfriend at the time, who after this now is now my wife, thankfully. And I just felt so guilty about it. I felt so bad about it. And I was talking to a friend and he was saying, well, look, if you hurt somebody you love, you jeopardized your entire future, you operated outside of your value system and lied, clearly sex must be more important to you than your own values and your relationships and the people you love. So maybe you should consider that you're an addict. That's Neil Strauss, a journalist and author of The Truth, an eye-opening odyssey through love addiction, sex addiction, and extraordinary relationships. The book Strauss refers to, titled The Game, was all about his exploits before he realized he was a sex addict. It is a miserable way to live a life. What a horrible way to live a life. And that's really the point, that you want to think it's okay or justify that this behavior is okay. But really, like... It is, just like anything, right? Just like trying to figure out where you're going to get your next fix from if you're a junkie all the time and living in that way. It doesn't lead to happiness. Sex addiction is basically often not about sex. It's often about validation. It's often about a compulsion. It's not about something you do with your partner and you feel good about it. It's about something you do in dark places and feel dreadful about and you cry about and you feel remorseful about and you often too often want to take your own life because of it. So sex addiction could be a serious disease and a serious problem. What it is is something that interferes with your life. So it's not just the desire to have great sex with your partner. That's pretty normal. But it's the desire to have dysfunctional sex, dysfunctional as you yourself, the patient in this situation, says is dysfunctional. And what makes it dysfunctional is that you don't want to do it, and it's ruining your life. But what does sex addiction look like? Rosenberg says use of pornography is one way it shows up. It's all over the Internet and easily accessible. People will use pornography often in a general population, and they may look at it for 10 minutes or 15 minutes or an hour, and who's to say whether that's right or wrong? But my patients look at it for hours. They'll be in the middle of the day in a busy work environment. They may even run the company, and they'll close the door and they'll find themselves lost in this world on their computers or on their phones, lost in this world of pornography. And they'll do whatever you do when you watch pornography. I understand it's family radio, but they'll do whatever they do, and at the end they'll feel absolutely terrible. And they'll go home to their wives or partners and feel just completely sapped of sexual desire and terrible for what they did. And then they may go to their church or synagogue and pray to God that they do not do this again, that they do not get so lost and are so sort of taken by pornography. And sex addiction may go beyond that. People see prostitutes and go to massage parlors and do all kinds of things to the extent that it really jeopardizes their lives, their family lives. And it's not congruent with their ideals. You know, they're not living the kinds of lives that they really want to live. Some people believe that sex addicts are simply trying to get off the hook for their behavior by saying they have a disease. Both Strauss and Rosenberg say nothing could be farther from the truth. Having that addiction, at least in my opinion, everybody else doesn't absolve you of the responsibility to heal it and repair it and for your, the consequences of your own behavior. I don't think anyone gets off or gets a free pass for being a sex addict. In fact, in court of law, I don't know about the court of public opinion, but in the court of law, having a sex offense, having a sexual disorder does not help you. In fact, it might even hurt you because judges fear that if you have a sexual disorder, your rate of relapse or recidivism, if you will, is, is that much higher. When I treat people, I'm very concerned about what they're doing, but I'm not there to judge them. I'm not there to say, are they good people or are they bad people? If someone comes in as an alcoholic, I don't decide if they're, you know, worthy of treatment or if they should be called an alcoholic or just a problematic drinker. I try to help people wherever they're at. But I don't think that, you know, in any way, shape, or form, in my mind at least, someone being a sex addict pardons particularly criminal behavior. No way.
And then there are the spouses and partners of sex addicts, the other victims. When someone is revealed as being a sex addict to their spouse, when the spouse goes on their phone and discovers all this terrible information about various partners, so forth and so on, you know, the spouse really needs a lot of support, and the spouse suffers what I call betrayal trauma. And that's a devastating trauma, you know, to feel that the person you've relied on is now completely betraying your trust, sexual and otherwise. So you need a multimodal treatment. You need treatment that addresses them psychologically, biologically, and addresses the family unit. And that could be individual treatment, could be medication. It could also be group therapy. So in my practice, people come together for groups for alcohol problems, for opiate problems, but also for sex problems because they can really understand each other and help each other to stay away from the triggers and the things that are going to bring them back to their compulsion. Triggers for compulsive sexual thoughts and behaviors are everywhere in our culture, from billboards to explicit lyrics in songs, ads on TV, TV shows themselves, to Hollywood movies and even the way some men and women dress. But Rosenberg says that doesn't excuse the sex addict. There are triggers everywhere for alcohol, right? Every TV show you turn on, every way of celebrating or of mourning for that way often involves alcohol. I think sex is harder, and that's why it's in some ways a much harder compulsion to beat. However, sex addicts, as I said before, aren't dealing with sex per se. They're dealing with dysfunctional sex. So... The sex they have with their partner is often fine. In fact, unfortunately, people who are sex addicts are very often not having sex with their partner. So you have to deal with their fetishistic sex, their desire for shoes or their desire for unusual and problematic sexual behaviors, which are dangerous and get them in trouble. But how often does that go on? Rosenberg says that's controversial as well. It depends on who you ask, of course, but the good studies that I like are 1 to 4% of the general population. The compulsion for sex and the conflicts we have about sex are not confined to that 1 in 4% with extreme forms of behavior. Many of us deal with the desire to do something, to want something, which we know is not in our best interest. And that's part of our, in some ways, evolutionary heritage. We want to procreate. We also want to socially bond. And sometimes those desires, the need to procreate, the desire to procreate, have sex, the desire to socially bond and stay connected to a family, sometimes those desires are at odds with each other. And that's not confined to the 1% to 4% of people who I would call a sex addict. Rosenberg says the roots of sex addiction can start at a very early age, partly because technology makes pornography so readily available. I think it's a real problem for families in general, and I think it's a problem for young children. I mean, the average age of looking at pornography is well below 12 or 13. Some people say as young as 11. It's very uncommon nowadays for kids who, in my world in Manhattan, to not have some, and by kids I mean under the age of 15, to not have some experience with pornography or sexting or some kind of explicit sexual material that they are looking at or even transmitting on their phones. And I think that's going to change our brains. So where is the line between normal sexual behavior and addiction? Is looking at women and at porn just something some guys do? I think I would then answer most unhealthy guys think that way. You know, it's funny. We have a way, I had a way of thinking, oh, this is just what guys are like. They just look at people and objectify them and fantasize about them. But as I got healthy, I stopped doing that. So I think we always think that we're normal. What we think is what everyone else thinks. And you start to realize, well, that's true. So I would say most unhealthy people think that way. The fact is, We're living through a fascinating time where people are starting to ask these questions about things that have been taken for granted, and I think they're good questions to ask, you know, and it's good for the culture to be in that question, and I hope it ends up in a place that's kind of safer and healthier for everybody. The Me Too movement is long overdue, and I think that this concern is quite legitimate, and if you ask me, it's really the tip of the iceberg of the exploitation of women, sexual and otherwise, in the workplace. Some of this is normal, and all of this needs to be dealt with, and we can't just kind of wish it away. Twelve-step programs exist for both sex addicts and their partners. 
You can learn more about them and both of our guests and their books by visiting our website at radiohealthjournal.net. Our writer-producer this week is Polly Hansen. I'm Reed Pence. Do you often misplace your keys, forget names, or lose your train of thought? You may be one of over 10 million Americans with undiagnosed MCI, or mild cognitive impairment. The Banner Alzheimer's Institute estimates 65% of MCI patients eventually develop dementia. But the good news, according to Ohio State University neurologist Dr. Douglas Share, is... While there's currently no cure for Alzheimer's disease, the most common type of dementia, the earlier we detect mild cognitive impairment, the better chance we have to treat it and delay progression of the disease. Fortunately, there's now a 15-minute at-home screening test called Brain Test, clinically validated to detect MCI. And for a limited time, you can receive a 30-day free trial to Brain Test by visiting braintest.com. The sooner you screen, the more treatment options available, so don't delay. Again, for your 30-day free trial, visit braintest.com. That's braintest.com. Thank you for listening to Radio Health Journal, a production of MediaTrax Communications. If you enjoyed this week's show, please leave a review on iTunes or share it with a friend. You can find more Radio Health Journal stories about health, science, and technology on iTunes, Stitcher, and at RadioHealthJournal.net.